Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily. He'll share a couple of stocks that are bubbling up to the top of the pile for him. The S&P pushing up through the course of the day, energy really leading the way higher yet again. I feel very much like a broken record. I was talking with uh, Arthur Hill earlier today, and we, we uh, commiserated on the uh, challenges of being a broken record. However, it's fine. If it keeps working, why not stick with it? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets, connecting the short-termism of today with the long-termism that most investors most likely should be living a little more uh, along the lines with. Let's think about how these short-term movements of a day like today fit into the longer-term trend. I would argue that this stretch here the last week and a half has really been a digestion phase of sorts had the big meal a couple fridays ago the big rally three of the last uh, four days at that point were pushing really really uh, high closing at the highs of the day and from there we've sort of been sideways we've been chopping around this uh this uh this sort of general range we're rallying yet again up to 4160 the s p sort of pushing the upper end of that range so the question that remains is do we have enough buying power to push us to new uh, to new swing highs to indicate that this is not just a choppy range, but this is the wait before the next uh, the next leg higher. The charts will tell you when that's happening. And I think a lot of people spend too much time guessing what might happen, thinking about what should happen. Focus on what is happening. Focus on the uh, the message that are embedded directly into the price charts. We have great guests on the show. I'm really excited to talk with uh, Larry Tentarelli. He's one of my uh, one of my favorite guests. Great. I was described Larry as one of my favorite pure stock pickers. So excited to hear what he is looking at. Uh, tomorrow on Wednesday, we have Sam Stovall. Uh, Sam is a, uh, a very successful investment strategist. He wrote a number of books, uh, books including the S&P's Guide to Sector Rotation. On Thursday the 9th, we have Pat Ceresna from Blue Chip, uh, excuse me, from um, Big Picture Trading. Join me, excuse me. And then next week on Tuesday the 14th, we have Mish Schneider, uh, host of um, Mish's Market Minute. Uh, here on Stock Charts TV and, uh, and joining us from uh, New Mexico. Let's continue on today's show. Let's recap this activity in the markets. As I mentioned, my summary of this day is the market pushing higher through the courts of the day, energy, and then everything else. A familiar story to describe these markets, and today was sort of all of that uh, in, uh, in one trading day. The S&P finishing up about 1%, finishing just below 4160. And as you can see, sort of a steady rise through the course of the day, particularly in the afternoon uh, session. The NASDAQ up about 1% using the NASDAQ composite as well. Mid caps, the best out of the uh, the four up one and a quarter percent. And the VIX actually trickling below 25 today, down to 24. This is all time low volatility, if by all time you mean the last uh, couple months. But in terms of the overall longer term history of the VIX, this is kind of middle of the road, to be honest. 20 was what I was always taught, but you know, above or below 20 sort of indicated excessive volatility or you know lesser volatility. Uh, that that range has been redefined a bit recently, but uh, certainly from uh, from being uh, in the upper mid 30s not too long ago, we certainly pulled back quite a bit as the S and P has uh, rotated off of the uh, the recent lows. Interest rates pulling back a little bit. Ten-year yield finished yesterday above three percent. We're back below it around 297, so not too much. Uh, and uh, the TLT uh, bouncing higher a bit today. Dollar next flat from yesterday. We're using the UUP for that one. Gold and silver prices both higher as well as the broader commodity complex. Crude oil prices, the best, uh, one of the best performers in our uh, group of commodity ETFs here. As I mentioned, the energy sector uh, continuing to uh, you know, push the longs and, uh, and going up and to the right. Some interesting movements in the last 24 hours in uh, crypto land. You can see Bitcoin currently around 31,150, uh, and that's after accelerating above the 30,000 level. Again, we talked so many times about 
big round numbers, 30,000 yet again playing a, a role. And I would always remind you to keep a focus on where we're at relative to those uh, those key levels. That's where a lot of investors kind of naturally question where a, a particular asset could be or should be because the first digit changes. It seems like a little thing, but it really is not when you look at uh, look at market history. Ether uh, prices down as well, uh, excuse me, up as well, accelerating into, uh, into uh, the aftermarket here, uh, equity-wise, uh, currently just above 1850. Let's go to the daily chart of the S&P 500. We refer to this most days on the uh, at this point in the program. And uh, again, what I mentioned in the introduction, I think the story of this market over the last seven or eight sessions has been unchanged, right? Right now, we literally closed almost to the penny at the same level that we were, not last Friday, but the Friday before that. Was that just before the long holiday week, you had the acceleration off of the lows around 38.10. We pushed quickly four out of five sessions with these big, uh, up days closing near the highs of the day that finished with a first close above that 38.2% retracement level. From there, we have literally gone nowhere. We've moved around a lot and a lot of individual names have been on the move just fine. But in terms of the overall progress, what has the S&P done from that point to this point? Besides chop around a little bit, nothing, right? We're sort of just continuing to rotate around this 38.2% level. The market is telling you that 41.25 is about where the S&P is. When you look at the, you know, the, the buying power, the demand that's built into the market, the selling pressure, the, you know, the, the, uh, the supply that goes into the market as investors try to unload shares, it's evening out to the point that it's sort of right about where it is. So in this period of lower volatility, what you need to do is wait for the move, right? At some point, the move happens. And we've settled into a pretty good range here with sort of 4170, 4180, we'll call it. On the upper end, that was a high from last week. On the lower end, around 4070. So you have about a 100 point range on the S&P. One of these two things is going to happen probably in the next couple of days would be my guess. We either break above there, we start getting above 4200. We break below there, we start getting below 4050. And I would argue whichever one of those happens, I would assume that you see much further movement in that direction because the market's in equilibrium now. If we break out of this range, that tells you one side, either buyers or sellers anecdotally have taken control and are pushing the market in that new direction. I would wait for that break and uh, and, and uh, certainly expect that the next major movement most likely happens in that, uh, in that next direction. Let's look at sectors here very briefly. As I mentioned, it was sort of energy and everything else, which is a familiar sort of that's sort of 2022 in one sentence. It's sort of higher rates and outperforming energy, but energy, the XLE up 3% today. After that, a bit of a drop off to a group of stock, a group of uh, ETFs that were up over 1%, industrials, healthcare, tech, real estate. On the downside, only one of the S&P sectors down, consumer discretionary, staples right above that, up half a percent, and then utilities. So it wasn't really sort of that offense over defense, cyclicals over defensive, sort of a mishmash of things, but clearly energy and everything else. I mean, I think that continues to be sort of the, the general theme that I would uh, I would rely on. If you look at the stocks that were gaining the most today, it's some of these things like Apache and VLO, many of these making new 52-week uh, uh, highs today, COP, XOM, these are some of the big integrated companies uh, making new highs. If you look at the large cap scooter rankings, so this is basically a technical ranking, a proprietary ranking system that we developed at Stock Charts a number of years ago, ranks a group of stocks. So we have the large cap universe that we're looking at from strongest uptrend to strongest downtrend. Number one is EQT, then Oxy and Valero. And you can see that most of these top 10 are all in one sector, uh, the energy sector. So as I mentioned earlier, I was talking with uh, Art Hill, who's a longtime Stock Charts uh, contributor, uh, host of, uh, of his own show um, on, uh, on Stock Charts TV as well. Uh, it hosts the, uh, the, uh, the founder of Trend Investor Pro. And we were talking about energy. We were basically lamenting the fact that after all of these months, we're still sort of pitching same idea, which is long energy. Energy is kind of working. And, 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 and what we sort of reassured our ch- each other on was as long as that continues to work, why would you, why would you change that? So you know, have some of these rallied significantly? Absolutely. Are, are some of these overbought? Many of them are because they're all making new highs. I learned a long time ago not to be afraid of new highs, but to embrace them, right? Stocks making new highs usually are making new highs for a reason. The same comes on the opposite side. So stocks and sectors making new lows are usually best off uh, avoided because uh, price usually comes down for a reason. So if you look at the uh, types of names that are struggling, the types of names that are rolling over, that's where you want to start thinking about you know, potential support and their ability or even the inability 
uh, to hold support. I'm looking at some of these like Clorox is probably a good example. So the challenge with CLX is, 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 is multiple, multiple facets. There are multiple facets to the, uh, the negative pattern here, but overall, it's just the fact that this is a, a, a chart between two or below two moving averages. The 200 day moving average has been sloping downwards since February of last year. So almost a year and a half. You've had the 200 day moving average sloping downwards. We've had a number of attempts to regain that 200 day moving average, which have all failed. Once again, we're making a new swing low, a new close, uh, closing low for the last three months. And now you're heading once again back to the uh, to the previous low. So in this kind of chart, you know, would you expect support down here in the 125 region, 125, 130? Probably, and and the question though the 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 question mark would be is that a short term bounce? Is that people that are going to come in and bet on a short term rally off of the lows, or is that something more sustainable? More sustainable reversals are what you really want to pay attention to, and you know, and 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 signs that we've rotated from a pattern of distribution to a pattern of accumulation. Just to bring it back and, and complete our segment, that's what brings me back to the chart of the S and P five hundred. I think what I've seen now off of the lows around thirty eight ten is a nice initial move. This is one leg higher. And getting above the swing high around 40, uh, 80, we'll call it, was pretty significant. But from there, we haven't followed through at all. We've basically been chopping around which move is next. That's what we want to be watching for through the remainder of this week and probably into next week. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Larry Tentarelli. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. Welcome back to the show. I want to uh, make a couple quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Larry Tentarelli. First off, we welcome your uh, your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show, and we'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air in our next mailbag segment Friday of this week. You can get your emails to us, uh, get your questions to us one of three ways via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com, on Twitter at finalbarsctv, or on YouTube, Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air in our next mailbag segment on Friday of this week. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. It is completely free. It is our on-demand platform. It is available on the website, StockChartsTV.com. Uh, comments from Larry Williams, from Ms. Schneider, from expert guests like Larry Tentarelli and many others coming through this show and our other great programming, all available at our website and also on your mobile device, to search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Larry Tentarelli. Larry's the founder of Blue Chip Daily, is one of the most prolific social media contributors that I've uh, ever uh, come across, always uh, sharing a, a new chart to look at. Larry, welcome back to the show. Good to hear from you. Dave, good afternoon. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. I want to bring up your charts because uh, as I, I usually uh, sort of tease your appearance by talking about your, your great stock picking prowess, because I feel like you're always highlighting charts that, uh, that I really appreciate uh, taking a look at. We're starting in the material sector with ALB with kind of a nice rotation higher, right? Yes. Yeah, so ALB, so this is a new recent position for me, but what I see on the chart, as you know, I, I keep it simple as far as trend following. And my key focus is I look for stocks that are trading over a rising 50-day moving average and over a rising 200-day moving average. So you can see with Albemarle, near-term uptrend, it's got a series of higher highs, uh, recently 273 and change. It's got a series of four higher lows. The recent one was 232 and change. So big breakout. I think they, they uh, raised the earnings guidance higher. Big breakout. Goldman Sachs put out a report last week, and they said they thought the end uh, was in the move for lithium. So they probably wanted to get some positions in there. So they took the stock down a little bit, but it's moving back. Uh, it bounced off 230 to 235. It's uh, been leading recently. And, and the key level on this chart, near term, 245 to 250. If you take a look two days ago, you can see it tested just under 245. 
and then started to trade through that. But but this is one of the better charts on my screen, longer term, and especially that 250 level uh, is key. If you go back to September of 2021, you can see that it topped at 251.74, uh, down to 200. And then it's it's been choppy since then. But I think on this move back over 250, with we've got four rising moving averages right now, I, I think that there it's a volatile stock. But I think that it's got some room to the upside. Uh, and you can see there's been some nice volume coming in over the past month or so. Not a bad chart, and I'm I'm just I'm I'm noticing that pattern of higher highs and higher lows, which is a perfect segue to your chart number two, Chevron. Sure. We've talked about energy before. What do you see at this point? So Chevron, this this has been one of my favorite positions all through 2022, and as you know, I've been uh, bullish on the energy sector for the past year and a half, and it just continues to move higher. So with Chevron, 170 to 175 is a key recent breakout level. So if you go back to March, you see 173, 173 in April, 174. So it failed three times just over 170. Then recently it had the big breakout moves, tested 180, uh, and then held over 170 on the pullback. So overall, I think the sector is still set up great. Now, if we take a look at some of the charts, XLE, might be a little bit extended shorter term, Valero, Marathon, some of the refiners, but the entire sector overall trades at 17 times earnings, 2.8% dividend, and 10 times forward earnings. So overall, even though it's had a monster run, and I think that XLE is up 60% year to date, you know, 10 to 15 times earnings in a market where crude oil is trading over 120. Now, at some point, the moves come to an end. I know that that the energy sector, there's been, uh, you know, people have been thinking it was going to come to an end sooner. But as long as this uptrend keeps higher and, and 155, 150 to 155 on that Chevron chart, as long as it holds over that level, I'm going to give the longer term uptrend the benefit of the doubt to the upside. So it's interesting that in this environment, Larry, we have about a minute left, but you know, one of the, you know, a whole area of names that we're not talking about today at all on the show, I feel like, are things like the FANG stocks, sort of, the, you know, the sort of tech consumer sort of space, consumer getting hurt a little bit. But, you know, when you think of some of those uh, larger technology names, what would you need to see to be more interested in those? Is it just a simple, you know, question of rotation or is it an interest rate play in your mind? How do you think about sort of the FANG space in this kind of environment? It could be a little bit of an interest rate play. I think if CPI, for whatever reason, came in weaker than expected, if bond yields broke down below 270, if there was any positive news from either CPI, bond yields, or the Fed, then I think it could take some pressure. But if you take a look at Microsoft, you know, it's got some longer term support beneath it, but declining 10 week moving average. The 40 week or the 200 day just started to roll over there. So I'm not bearish on these on these bangs. I don't have any of them right now, but I think I'd want to see some more base building. I'd want to see it start to trade over 280, maybe see some of the shorter term moving averages turn up. So I'm, I'm just neutral. I'm, I don't have any long positions there. I'm open minded, but you know, just not the best charts on the screen right now. Yeah, I don't know if there's a, ever a time when I'd not want to own the best charts. And you usually do a great job, Larry, of surfacing those for all of us. It's great to hear from you. Thanks again for coming on the show. Stay safe there, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Dave, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That's Larry Tentere. Larry's the uh, founder of Blue Chip Daily. Great conversation, great, great thoughts on just the idea of trend following. When, when Larry shares charts like ALB, um, like Chevron, others with these nice consistent rotations with these uptrends, just a great reminder of the value of trend following, right? Energy has been a pretty good place to be for quite some time. It's not like that message just emerged recently, right? There have been signs all along the way that an area like energy is working. And often when things start to work, I get people already saying, you know, did I miss it? Is it too late? And I, you know, I think in the future, years and years from now, we will look back at this period where charts like uh, Chevron and others are just consistent outperformers. And the chart tells you that that's most likely the case. Great take there from Larry Tentarelli at uh, Blue Chip Daily.
Let's continue on our show with the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, we're here for your questions at the final bar at stockcharts.com. And let's get to question number one. When all is said and done, it seems that direction of interest rates is the most important indicator to determine whether we are in a bull market or bear. Currently, they are rising, thus we are in a bear market. Am I oversimplifying things? My short answer is yes, very much so. Um, and I don't, I love the, I tell you what, you know, first off, I love how you're thinking about what interest rates mean relative to stocks. And what I have found working with institutional investors, money managers, you know, strategists, analysts, we spent an inordinate amount of time thinking about interest rates and inflation and, uh, and, and different asset classes, the dollar, different, you know, Aussie yen cross and all these things all to help us understand what was happening in the equity markets. We didn't trade those things. We just used them to better understand the world around us. And I find with individual investors and uh, financial advisors, often we like to simplify a little too much. I find a little too much oversimplification, thinking that these charts are fine and it doesn't matter much what's going on outside there. And I hope one of the big things you take away from uh, some of the conversations on this show is the value of understanding the world around us. And I think technical analysis can give you a very good way to do that. So yes, I think you're oversimplifying a little bit by saying that you know rates and the direction of the S&P are closely aligned. And I'll tell you why. I'm gonna change this chart here and just show the S&P at the bottom. So here I have uh, the 10-year yield. I'm looking at uh, value versus growth as chart number two. And then I'm looking at the S&P 500 large cap uh, index. Now this isn't log scale, but sorry about that. Uh, just assume that it's a beautiful log scale chart here at the bottom, but it does give you the sense of the direction. There are times when the market rallies and rates are going higher. And a perfect example, that is off of the lows in 2020. From 2020 to late 2021, the market is rallying and rates are overall going higher during the course of that period. There are also plenty of times when the market goes lower and, uh, and rates are going higher, uh, which is an example of that would be 2022, right? The market's coming down, 10-year yields obviously going, during the roof, the, going through the roof. The opposite happens too. In 2019, the market rallied, even though rates are coming down. So the, the idea of interest rates and probably even better, the shape of the yield curve, which was the other series at the bottom of this chart, twos versus tens or three month versus 10 years, something like that. That tells you a lot about uh, market leadership. And I would tell you that one of the reasons why people have made this simple relationship that you're asking about is because it's been such a growth oriented market. It's been the FANG stocks, the technology stocks, consumer names that have been running those tend to do better in a lower rate environment. And so as a result, there's been that a bit of an inverse relationship of sorts. Um, having said that, no, I don't think there's a great way to, uh, I don't think you can assume, even if you knew with perfect foresight what the 10-year yield was going to do, you will have an idea of headwinds and tailwinds. You will not know for sure what the S&P is going to do. And even growth versus value, sometimes it becomes disconnected a little bit from that ratio, but higher rates usually means stronger value, weaker growth on a relative basis. That's why I have that as one of the key indicators on my chart there. Question number two, what do you make of the bearish RSI divergence for the XLE? And I love this question because I knew uh, as I was reading through some of the questions before the show, I knew Larry was coming on and uh, he was bringing Chevron along with him. So uh, what do we make of that? Now, you sent this in a little bit ago uh, when before we've had this most recent upswing. Um, so the question was really around this period, right? Higher highs in price, weaker RSI, uh, really across the board on a lot of energy names, particularly the XLE was, uh, was, uh, would have this case as well. So what, am I, what do I make of it? Um, you know, overall, it's, it's a warning sign, right? For me, it's a red flag. It tells me to pay attention. And so when I see stocks in an uptrend, and I start to see a bearish momentum divergence similar to the S&P October through, or excuse me, November of last year through January of this year, that was put it on the, on, the, on the red flag list. Now, it doesn't tell me to sell. It doesn't tell me that the market is done because that's where you wait for confirmation. And what we did not get from energy charts and, and from the XLE in particular was a confirmation. We pull back to the 50-day on the XLE, but continue to move higher. We actually eventually made new highs and it's no longer a bearish momentum divergence. It's really more of a confirmation as price is moving higher and we're pushing once again into that overbought region. So yes, bearish momentum divergences are a warning sign, just like bullish momentum divergences after a downtrend are a warning sign. That's when I put it on a piece of paper or on a watch list and wait to see what the evidence tells me soon after. Next question. Apple has the rising PMO in short-term charts, but not the weekly timeframe. Should I interpret it as Apple long-term downtrend? Uh, really good question. Let's bring up a chart here. So we have Apple 
Um, I don't normally drop the PMO on here, but I'm going to drop uh, the PMO, uh, which is this. If you're not familiar, the PMO, uh, Price Momentum Oscillator, is an indicator designed by Carl Swenlin. So if you watch the Decision Point programming on, uh, on Stock Charts TV or read it, Carl and uh, Aaron Swenlin's articles, they will quote the PMO often. It is very similar to MACD. It's actually much closer to PPO, the percent price oscillator. They're almost identical, um, the, the two of those. Uh, but it is one of the core parts of their trend following uh, methodology. And similar to a MACD, uh, it, it's going to give you similar signals. And uh, it's a lagging indicator telling you when trends have reversed higher or lower. Here's the PMO with their normal settings, which are a little longer term than the MACD that many of you uh, most likely use. Uh, just recently giving a buy signal on uh, on Apple as we rallied higher. And you can see the PMO starting to uh, to turn higher. If we make this a weekly chart, which means I go like this and like this will take like six years. What is that telling us? So here it's more of a uh, still a downtrend, not giving a buy signal yet. So when something is in a downtrend and when uh, Apple is moving lower and you can see that the PMO is negative because uh, it's uh, it's in a negative configuration sell signal there in uh, in January uh, to February of this year. That tells you that longer term trend is confirmed downwards. If and when something like Apple bottoms out, the daily PMO would most likely give you the signal first. I actually would have to by definition. I don't think it's theoretically possible to not do that, although I might be wrong, but pretty much the daily chart is always going to pick up on the short term bounce first. If and when it's confirmed on the weekly uh, PMO, that's when it tells you that yes, we are definitely in an established uh, uptrend. So this configuration right now tells you the medium longer term trend on Apple is still negative. According to this indicator, the short term trend more positive. Great questions there, by the way. Please keep them coming. Uh, send us your questions via email. We need to wrap this show and go to the three and three. Let's hit on three charts that tell the story of this market in just under three minutes. Chart number one is the S&P 500 along with percent of stocks above their 200 day, percent of stocks above their 50 day. This is not quite updated for today's close just yet, but we'll be very closely. And what I'm noticing is as of yesterday's close, 48% of the S&P members are above their 50 day. That's not a ton and it's not more than 50%. That 50% line, which is this pink horizontal line is one of the basic ways that I think in the short term, are we seeing better buying or better selling, right? When there's a broad advance, that indicator should be above 50%. When there's a broad decline, it should be below 50%. It has been below 50% since mid-April. That's when the S&P was getting, uh, you know, sort of reverting back below some moving average support, making a new uh, new low to just above 3,800. From there, we have bounced, and the indicator still has not quite gotten above 48%. Uh, percent. I would be keeping an eye on this, certainly through the remainder of this week into next week, can it get above 50%? The real bullish rotation, if you want to hear me start to get more bullish about the S&P, broadly speaking, I would need this top indicator percent above their 200 day to get above 50%. We're nowhere near that level just yet. Chart number two is the XLE. Uh, as I mentioned, I was talking with Art Hill earlier today. I hadn't speak, spoken to him in, uh, in a little while, and it was great to catch up. And we were talking about energy. We immediately were just talking about the strength in energy and how much of an outlier it is. It's such a great reminder on the value of charting. Charting tells you, technical analysis tells you that this is working. It doesn't need to tell you why it's working or have you, you know, speculate what should happen. It's just telling you what is happened. This is fact, this is price going higher. And once again, we're seeing the XLE making a new 52 week high. A lot of individual names like CVX and COP and others making a new high as well. Uh, price usually goes up for a reason and usually goes down for a reason as well. Chart number three is Albemarle, ALB. I enjoyed talking with uh, Larry Tenterelli today. I knew this was going to be the two, one of the two names that he shared with us. And I often talk on the show about accumulation phases and distribution phases, right? When you look at a chart, does it tell you that this stock is in an accumulation phase, meaning investors are overall accumulating, which means higher highs and higher lows, or distribution phase, lower highs, lower lows, heavier volume on down days? ALB is one of those charts that has rotated beautifully, you know, in uh, you know November through March, distribution phase, lower lows, lower highs, below both the moving averages. From there, it switched to more of an accumulation phase. You start putting in a higher low in April. We put in a higher high in May. From there, we're continuing pushing, uh, pushing to the upside. Trends like this tend to persist and continue to watch those lows that the low prices continue to get higher. That's it for our show. I want a special thanks to uh, Larry Tenterelli from Blue Chip Daily sharing some thoughts and some charts with us today. All of our previous interviews and episodes are for free at StockChartsTV.com. For StockCharts.com and Rebin Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.